This is the first time that at the Hanukkah we decided to meet for New Year, and I'm hoping that we can do this every New Year. Uh, inshallah, people are uh, have the time and would like to do this. It's a nice way to begin the, the New Year in the special place, the, the Hanukkah, which is uh, it is it is many things. So it is a place where people can. Uh, practice the traditional <coughs> devotions, like the prayer, <coughs> and uh, but it is very different from that. On the other hand, it's different from an, uh, the usual mosques because it's more the house of uh, spiritual expression, spiritual uh, striving, and of course it was the request and instructions from our teacher. May God keep him in his mercy. He, he asked uh, above everything else that we create this space. And um, the thing that, uh, if, if I think about the, the purposes um, and, and how to express it in, say, one line, uh, picking, say, the Masnavi, for example, although you could pick so many different books, but he, he read Rumi uh, and had memorized a huge amount of the Masnavi. I sometimes think he memorized all of it, but he certainly memorized huge amounts of the Masnavi. But he had his favorite um, passages, and um, so one of them, uh, just a uh, that he often quoted uh, is um, uh, Melate Eshk as Hama Din Ha Judas Ashakanra Melato Mazhab Hudas. So there's a very famous line coming from the Rumi's masterpiece, <coughs> and it comes at a place in the Masnavi where there's an ignorant shepherd. Um, saying that he's going to comb God's hair and pick lice out of his hair and clothing and wash his clothes and rub his little feet and so he's talking to God and Moses become very angry and Rumi uh, in this passage has God reprimanding Moses for being severe because Moses was was very severe having said that the story is a, is a is this particular story is a little bit long but this there's a, a statement in, uh, so this word melat, um, it can mean many things, but in the context, it means a, a religious people, or it means, therefore, their religion, but it means really like a people, like a whole, a nation. It can mean a nation. And so, uh, and, the, and this line says, um, so the people of love, or the religion of love, or the sect of love, you see, uh, uh, is is different, is is separate from all other religions. See, because the context of a melat in the Islamic culture is means like a a a uh, a large movement, and the melat uh, of, of Islam had spread already all the way to China and all the way to Spain at the time that that he's writing this. But he wants us to know that it is it is other than. It is distinguishable from uh, any of the religions. And then the next line he says, uh, for the lovers, meaning the lovers of God, and therefore the lovers of, of each other, uh, their sect, um, their creed, as it can mean creed, <coughs> uh, is, is God himself, is God. So, uh, what he's saying is that the, the, um, the, that the lovers, they are no longer restricted by the Zahed, by what, the outer part of the religion, or the outer part of being part of a, it also means a civilization, so you have a milat, it's like a whole religious civilization. Nothing wrong with that. 
is a very good thing, or it can be a very good thing. Uh, but, but for Rumi, uh, we see many uh, instances. We can all think of poetry from Hafez and so forth. But since our teacher frequently quoted Rumi, and since we're trying to understand um, what he was trying to give to us, is um, he, was, he was trying to give us a direct access. So this is, of course, uh, also with regard to Moses, this would be, Moses would represent the, the prophetic element that brings the revelation. But Moses also was taught by God that there's another dimension to the religion. So this is the, the direct uh, the, the Imladun. This is the the knowledge and the spirituality that God said was given to one of his friends, who is normally thought is to be Chizr. And Chizr accompanies Moses, and Moses uh, he says to Moses, You will have difficulty, meaning you will have you will not have patience, because this is a problem that we will have today in general, is that the people who are uh, purely involved with the religion, we have to be careful how we speak with them, because they will not be patient. They will not have the patience with what we have to say. Because how can somebody have patience with something they have not experienced? So we have to remember that, that the Sufism is the direct experience of God. Now, what is God for the Sufis? Huh? Uh, only recently I was telling Norman here uh, what the Sufis think God is. And what, was I, what was I saying? I was reading from Lahiji, and I was saying the Sufis say that God is what? Is existence. So we have this directly, meaning if we want to look into the what the Sufis say, and when they're not using metaphorical language, they're writing prose, and they're writing explanatory <clears throat> elucidations. They, they say that God, uh, they either say that God is existence, or they say um, that God is reality. So either way, because, because we, can under, we can grasp that, huh? Reality is is it true that reality as we see it, yes, from a certain point of view. But it's also the, the hidden element, huh? Uh, so that's why Shravastari says, Jahan Jumla Furur e Nur Hakdan Hakan Darbei Ze Paidoist Penhan. He says, uh, know that all of this world is the radiance of true, true reality's light. Um, but true reality is hiding using the disguise of obviousness. So through the disguise of obviousness, people cannot see true reality. And Rumi has similar statements like this. So again, coming to the Melate Ish, this is a, a new school. It's also sometimes called the Mazhabi Ish, and it's also called the Maktabi Ish, the school of love, the, the sect of love, the creed of love. Um, but Melat is a, is a big word. It's a, it's a word that has a contextual meaning that really means like a civilization, uh, a religious civil, civilization. So you have, you have a, 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 a He's saying that that um, this this particular uh, civilization that he's talking about, or this nation, or this people, this spiritual people, uh, they are they are separate from the categories, the religious categories, huh? And for those people, the lovers, um, their 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 sect or their creed is actually not other than that which the religion is pointing to. Or if you have a prophecy, the prophecy is saying, here's how you go there. You have a prophet, a messenger. The messenger brings a message. And the message says, here, read the message, here's how you can go to this place. And 
today uh, we live in the Western world um, as, a, as a minority, those of us who are Muslim, and the Sufis have always lived as a minority in, in the cultures that they operated in. They may have had different, uh, more external members who, who belong to the, the, the Sufi organization once upon a time in Afghanistan. A huge, huge number of people had some connection to the Sufi orders, but very few people were, were uh, doing the, the kinds of practices that would lead them to direct perception, direct vision. And, and so, um, now, is this, how mysterious is this? Um, it's not that mysterious, uh, um, because um, Rumi, again, and these teachers, all of these teachers, uh, he, he says, um, uh, he says, John Shao, wa as rahi John John Roshanas. Yare binesho nafarzandi teos. So he says to find out about this, just become that thing. So he says, become spirit, become spirit, and 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 through the actual direct manner of spirit, come to know what spirit is. You know, it doesn't have a secondary way to go to it. It doesn't have. Uh, it has. There, there is a way to come to this this position, the position that there's no other way. And that, that could be very long. It could take people 50 years. And maybe after 50 years they say, oh, I see. It will not be through some formal thing that I will come to know this. Because actually this is too simple for explanation. Simple in the sense of so profound and so universal that it's so, it's so ubiquitous, it's everywhere. It's the basis of everything. It's too simple for explanation. So the, the intellect, the reasoning, uh, the argument will not be able to grasp it. But once a person is willing to um, start at that point, then from then on, it is only a direct uh, approach. Because a person realizes, I have no other way but to give up those tools that I was using. I was trying to understand it. So later, again, I can try to understand it. Because they don't mean universally forever. They mean for this time that you're doing spiritual practice. Usually we call it zikr, we call it meditation, we call it a number of things. Because the Sufis, they're not against the intellect. They want a person to have a good intellect to arrive at this beginning position. And in Qur'an, we also see that God wants us to use our intellect to <clears throat> grasp certain fundamental points. The shara'at, the, the conditions for, so the intellect for there. But up to that point, fine. But after that point, there's only a giving up. Giving up of whatever one imagined, whatever one thought. And to um, at least be confident in the the theoretical proposition that by giving all of these up, we could find what is left. And what is left would be the, the ground, which is called love also. Because whoever uh, attains to this, they, they are actually attaining to unity. And unity, um, tawhid, unification, is, is uh, experienced as, as several things at once that are interrelated, several things that are interrelated. And one of them, one of the primary um, names we could give is, is real love, not um, uh, uh, metaphorical love, which is a good thing in and of itself, but the, this, this real love. So that's why when he says Asha Khan, he's talking about this. So, uh, Recently, things are so terrible um, that some of our discussions they have to go to this, this place and, and where we are looking at the people of the externals are so external that we have to um, consider what is very basic. 
And so, as you know, I've been quoting to you certain things, and one of the things that interested me is, is right after the death of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, and when Abu Bakr was elected, um, the armies, there were different generals in the armies, and as you know, um, there were uh, families that once had been the enemies of the Prophet, peace be upon him. They were now in, in his armies. So whether it was, um, you know, Khalid ibn Walid, or the family, the, the larger family of Usman, Muawiyah, and his family, these people were serving in the military for the expansion of, of the, the Islamic armies. And as, uh, so in this case, there's very many of them, but you may recall that, that Abi Sufyan uh, and these people who were the enemies of the, 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 the Prophet, peace be upon him, were now uh, working for him. And you have um, uh, Muawiyah, you also have Yazid. I'm talking about the brother, the, the, the son of, of Abu Sufyan and, and the brother of Muawiyah, okay? So he becomes one of the generals. And, and uh, uh, so the particular quote that I want to read to you is from Abu Bakr's recorded address to those armies as they go to, uh, into North Africa. Quote, when you leave a place, do not cause them difficulty in marching. This is considering, uh, first of all, as a general, his attitude towards his own army, and then secondly, to the people that they conquer. When you leave a place, do not cause them difficulty in marching, meaning your army. Do not punish your men harshly. Consult them on every matter. Do not abandon justice and stay far from injustice and tyranny because no tyrant nation has ever obtained success. Do not slay any small child, old people, women, or pre-adolescent. Do not approach the harvest of the trees. Crops should not be burnt, nor fruit trees cut. Do not slaughter any animal, <coughs> which is impermissible. Do not break any agreement which you make with the enemy, and after peace, do not tear up your treaties. Remember that you will also meet such people who have undertaken monasticism in their monasteries, thinking this to be for the sake of Allah. Do not interfere with them, and do not destroy their monasteries, and do not kill them. So this goes on and on in this, in this vein. Now this is the, we know a lot, reading even the Qur'an, we know about the, the wars that happened um, and, and, and the terrible things that happened. More people are aware of that, but people aren't aware because they're often, uh, the lunatics who are out there today, they're talking about going back to the original Islam. This, this is, if you read what happened at the beginning and you read uh, so many details, you, you realize why the, the old Islam that you know about is correct. See, this new, these new ideas that have spread largely because of the Wahhabi influence, this is not correct. You just have to read the early history and you can see for yourself what, what the situation was. So, unfortunately, we're forced to, to uh, uh, need to understand these things to know exactly what was said, exactly what was done. So when we meet anyone who says otherwise, we, we actually know uh, the references that we are using. How did it happen that for centuries Islam had been a spreading civilization? And when you read in every case, in every case, uh, when the armies left, uh, the, the biggest problem was in the Islamic uh, armies themselves because for so many years, not years, centuries, centuries, uh, the Persians 
were fighting the Romans. And the, the, um, the armies of the Persians included those Arabs who were in Iraq. And the armies of the Christians, Byzantium, those were the, those were the people in Syria. So these are the converts into Islam, and they still hate each other. So when we read about the early, the very earliest times in Islam, and we find out about Usman being killed and all of these, you know, these these early battles and so forth after the passing away of the Prophet, peace be upon him, we have to understand that a lot of the problems we saw, they they came out of an existing culture. Uh, there were some wild people. They generally they they're called the the Qura. They're 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 from Qarya. They're they're from the villages. The village people. They're wild. They're uneducated, and they would go fighting only because they wanted to get loot, booty. They wanted to. So these people remain, and they become powerful, and they and they are powerful, and they're making so much trouble. So 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 we have to understand that a lot of the trouble we're reading about and bloodshed. Is, is based on the existing circumstances and what happened in those circumstances. And, uh, but coming back to, to the, the uh, so you have a melat forming. You have a nation, uh, a large nation. It's a civilization forming. And, and, and you know, the people like Ustad Halili, he called it melat e tawhid. So the, the people of unity, the creed of unity, this is what was spreading in Islam. And he says, how sad that the people of unity are always at each other's throats. That's a paradoxical thing. It's called the people of unity, they're always at each other's throats. And, and, uh, but, so, so Rumi, but for Rumi, the, 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 uh, the answer is at several levels, including the religious level, but Rumi is a mystic, and he knows that uh, the Sufis know that most people, uh, they have a name for things and they actually don't know what that name means. So they've given it a name, whatever the name is. God, love, whatever. They don't, they don't, they have a very small, restricted idea of what this means. And so that's why they try to explain uh, that the only way you can find out uh, is, in fact, by, by, merging with, becoming that thing. And, and so that's why, uh, for, for Rumi, this, you have this very famous idea that I talked about at the last meeting that goes back to Rabi'ah. And, and in our context, I think the best way to think of it is you have a school that goes back to the beginning. Rabi'ah is Hassan Basri's student, but she's really the first representative of the school of love. But all of those people, they are practicing asceticism. And that, though, that school of love is expanded. How does it become expanded? It becomes expanded because when they realize that egotism is the problem and any kind of love will erode, will wear down egotism. And that's why the Sufis, when they realize this, they stop stressing the formal outer aspect of the religion. They were, they were practicing it. Uh, if you look, our Ustad is a good example. He's a modern person, pro-education. You could even say like a feminist. I mean, honestly, when you think about all the people we know, he would have to be categorized as a feminist to some extent. Huh? I think the women here would agree. The, uh, he, he um, uh, interested in culture, uh, very um, sad and, and shocked by the, the falling of Islam into worse and worse circumstances over the decades. So he, of course, uh, spoke a lot uh, about these things. Huh? And uh, so we, we have to understand that um, Sufis like Ustad, they, they held a clear um, orientation, let's call it a spiritual orientation towards the beloved is God. But they taught, lots of people here know, he taught 
love each other. Because if you don't get, know yet about God's love, practice this in prayer. Practice your spiritual um, exercises, your prayers, so that you could get to know God. But it, but also practice um, the metaphorical love. It's called Ishkemajazi. Because you you don't have that many choices that you think you have. Uh, looking at yourself in the mirror and you have a scar on your forehead, this is not a very good option. See? From from saying too many prayers. Because all that will happen is you'll be more in love with your image in the mirror. So they they stress uh, find some path, some way to love. Don't and, and this brings us into a very nice crossroads, brings us to a crossroads of the modern culture that we are in. Because in this modern crossroads of this culture, um, we, we let's say we have a friend. How many of you have Western friends? They say, I love my dog. Well, I'm one of your friends who loves his dog, so you would have to pretty much say, at least I know somebody who loves my dog. Huh? But certainly we know other people, they love their dog. Huh? And, 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 and we shouldn't have a negative attitude. Whenever we hear or see, we observe somebody loves something, we should say, this is uh, what Rumi's talking about. See, this is the, the melate ish. This is the, there's a nation, there's a people. Say it's a people. Because there's a people, they don't say that. There's a people that don't emphasize love. And love here, I'm talking using it in the general form of that word, because in fact, divine love is 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 um, is the water in that plant. You see, so any kind of love you see is like a flower bush, but divine love is the water that actually is the substance of this flower bush. So, from any one of those flower bushes you can find the water of love. You can find the source of that love. And sometimes in religions, all the religions of the world, they, they decide to use a special word for that. Like in Christianity, it's called agape. It means a universal love. You see, when you go to Hawaii, you know, and they come and they put a lei on you and they say aloha. See, see in Polynesian, because I was raised in Polynesian, they have... They have uh, they have uh, hinaro here and aroha. So hinaro means um, the the love of uh, the physical love, like someone is beautiful, and so you love that person. Uh, here means the love the humans love for another person, the, the love of the heart. And aroha is in Polynesian, depending which set of islands you are, they either use an L or an R. So in Hawaii, it's it's aloha. Or people now say aloha, see, it's aroha. And, and it means agape, it means this divine love, this spiritual love. So the, the, uh, this, this intersection of cultures, uh, uh, we, we are at a very odd time, a very difficult time. That's why I'm taking this moment to explain to you the religion of the Sufis and, and why it has something in common with the culture that you live in. Because we don't have to say to people uh, anything uh, about, especially the comparison of religion that leads to debate and argumentation. This is really useless. This is, it just leads to more trouble. But if when we say, if somebody says, well, tell me about your religion, we say, well, fine, what would you like to know? They will answer any question they have. On the other hand, if we say, if we see a mother loving her child, we say, this is the religion of the Sufis. This is the religion of love. When we see people, they are in love. They are, they are uh, two people. And remember, we are living in the West. Maybe they are not married. We don't, we don't care. This is not our business. We don't care. We are looking for the, the, the whatever affection there is that, that we can see its love. We are saying, this is love. And therefore, according to the Sufis, this is the only thing that will wash you. Nothing else will wash you. Everything else, you may think it will wash you, it will not wash you. Everything else is like putting, putting some perfume over 
dirt, over sweat, over an unbathed body. And only this love is the only thing that will actually wash you so that you don't need to put on a perfume. So, so the, 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 the Melata Ish is the, is the, is the Hanako. So there's a place for the Melata Ish, Hanako. So like if we are praying and someone wants to do their own prayer, and they want to do it their own prayer, they can, they can kneel and say uh, Catholic prayer, they can do whatever we want. We, we have no objection. You see, if someone is a, doesn't believe in God, we have no objection because they came out of some affection or they have some affection and they realize this was our position, that it wasn't dependent upon words, etc. So just remember this famous line, one of the most famous lines in all of the Masnavi, huh? Melate Esh as Hama Din Ha Judas. Ashekamra Melato Mashab Kudas. So the the creed of love, uh, the nation, in this case we could say in, in our context, in our cultural context, the creed of love is aside, is separate from all the religions. <clears throat> for for these lovers, meaning those who truly appreciate the value of love, <clears throat> their creed and their sect is God, is directly God, not, not through uh, definition of God or which religion it is. You see, it's separate, totally separate.